So today, um, we are lucky to have two um, Filipino, Filipino-American writers who will share with us their works. Um, first is Chris Santiago. Chris is the author of Tula. Anybody here who doesn't know what Tula is? What is Tula? Poem. It's poem in Tagalog, but it has also meanings in other languages, right? So, Tula is the Tagalog word for poem. The, um, Chris's book, which is published by Milkweed in last year, explores what it means to be the blood stranger, the second generation child of immigrants who is alienated from their language and landscape. Tula is Chris's debut poetry collection. It is the winner of the 2016 Lindquist and Venom Prize. The book grapples with what it means to be, bothly, to be both deeply informed and cut off from your parents' home. The book was partly inspired by interviews Chris conducted with his uncles. He has three uncles who were active in the anti-Marcos dictatorship movement, who fought against the Marcos regime at tremendous personal cost. As he told the PBS NewsHour, my uncles gave up so much. It was for a patriotism that I don't have allegiance to since I was raised here. But I wanted to tell their stories to keep their spirits alive. Chris is the recipient of fellowships from Kundiman and the Mellon Foundation slash ACLS and a finalist for the 2017 Minnesota Book Award to be announced in April. Chris received his PhD in English from the University of Southern California and teaches literature and creative writing at the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis. So, ladies and gentlemen, friends, let's all welcome Chris Santiago. Thank you, Noel. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you so much. Um, I've known about the Asian American Writers Workshop forever. Um, I'm older than I look, I think. I'm not sure how old I look, but um, I grew up in Minnesota. I went to school in Ohio. I lived in California for 15 years, and AAWW has brought so many writers up and, and nourished them and taught them. And, and so I'm, I'm really thrilled and honored to be in this space. And I'm honored to have this wonderful audience. It's amazing. Um, I grew up in Minnesota, and um, Part of what Tula is about, the reason why I called it Tula is I don't speak Tagalog or Ilango, which is my mother's language. Um, I, you know, I know some words, but I can't put a sentence together to save my life. And traveling to, actually I think I'll read a poem about that. Uh, trying to get a, a cab in Manila, it's fun, because as soon as they hear me, they figure out, like, oh, okay, I'm going to charge this guy more. Um, um, you know, that's, that's fair. But... Um, <laughs> I, I'm strangely nervous. Well, I'm, I'm more nervous than I usually am because um, there are so many speakers of Tagalog in this room. And when I launched my book in Minnesota, it was like I could say anything about Tagalog <laughs> and everyone would believe it. But, but in all seriousness, Minnesota is a, is a wonderful place to be a writer. And David Mora and Baofi both came to my book launch, so there's a strong community there. But this is, to see this, these faces, I'm, it's so wonderful to be part of this community and to have you welcome me here. Um, I think I'll start... The, uh, the first poem I want to read has, um, I, I use Bai Bayin characters, the, the book designer Mary Austin Speaker was kind enough to put these in, and um, I don't know, I felt affinity for this because this is an alphabet that was almost lost, or an abugada actually, because it's actually syllabic, and the pronunciation is based on like, what character comes after the next, as far as I know, really, um, and there are wonderful scholars of this in the Philippines, but it's something that survived and persisted despite colonization partly because of jewelry makers and um, others who are continuing to use these characters and preserve them. And so Tula, um, I had to look up that word in Google, actually, because I didn't know what the word poem was. Um, I'll explain a little bit about how I decided to title the title poem in the collection that. But um, I'm going to read this first poem, um, Tula. This is, this is from the, the book itself. Um, so originally the poem was one long poem, and it was published in the Asian American Literary Review um, that way. And then when I went to Kundiman, and Joseph Legaspi is in the front, so I'm always happy to see Joseph. It's, it's a, he's like a wonderful mentor, just a, a beautiful friend. And um, when, I, when I brought the poem to, um, to Kundiman, Oliver De La Paz said, 
you know, this poem, it's great, but it's long. It sort of sucks all the gravity of the whole book towards it, and then you don't really want to read the rest of the book. So why don't you try splitting it up throughout the rest of the collection? And I did, and I was like, well, how do they hold together? And I said, well, maybe if I had, have them all have the same title. So uh, what was once a long poem called Elegy became Tula, and every single poem that's part of this series in, in the book is called Tula. So every time you come to a Tula poem, it's supposed to be one long poem interrupted by other poems. Um, but I tried other titles, um, and then I just thought, well, what if I call it Tula because it means poem? I don't even know the word, but um, so on one hand, it's something very familiar that I should know. But it also, to me, to my ear, it's something that I had to learn here in the U.S. Uh, so I called it Tula. And I started thinking when the book was accepted, um, what, what, if, what does Tula mean in other languages, right? Because I, I was hearing it as, a, as just like a foreigner would hear it. I didn't know what it meant. And I found it's, it's this wonderful word. It was the name of a ship that discovered Antarctica, an English ship. It's the name of a language in the savanna in Africa um, that's still in use um, by every generation within, within that culture. It's also the Sanskrit word for Libra, which is my, uh, my son's birth sign. So this is kind of the first poem. It's sort of like a fake definition, which I stole that idea from A. Van Jordan, and I was so pleased that he picked the book for a prize because I didn't realize until afterwards that I was copying this form he had, the poem Afterglow in his book Magnolia, which is a wonderful book if you haven't read it. And he has this definition that becomes a poem. So Tula. Nahuatl near the cattails, ruined Toltec capital, tall Atlantes, sun-cut shields, god nest, bird song. Mongolian, willow-banked tributary of the Orkhon, Baltic, unreachable, russified to oblast, ironworks, hollow point, music box gilt and yellowed with orchids, islands, Passerines, Tula work. Chileno, slang for cock, also nightshade, bellflower. Solfege, veil and a sixth. English, square rigged for new continents. Almost marsh grass, ghosted to cato. Cotula, savanna tongue, rich in affix, in use by all generations. Sanskrit, Libra, scales, stars above our sun, was the weight of will. Nahuatl from the Nahuatl for what pleases the ear. Tagalog, Naporia, mother tongue, a poem. I was gonna wear this scarf as kind of a fashion accessory, but it's pretty hot in here. <laughs> so, oh, it, oh yeah, it does. I can't even see it. I'll, just, I'll, I'll leave that there for a season. We can have a divider. You can know this is your half and my half. And, <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to read this poem called Audiometry because hearing becomes really important. Um, uh, since I didn't speak my parents' language, I didn't really acquire it. And that, that happened for a lot of reasons. My mom was actually from, from the province's depot, it's like some people say, from, uh, she was in Ilango, and so her Tagalog was kind of funny, like my aunts would make fun of her. They would speak kind of this mishmash of Tagalog and Ilango in English. And then we didn't really have a community in the Twin Cities. We could have, but my parents, um, I'm, I'm not sure what reason, maybe they didn't want, they wanted to avoid the drama, <laughs> but they, 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 didn't, they weren't part of the community. Um, but um, my father started to lose his hearing when, um, when I was a child. And so this poem, Audiometry, is partly about that, but it's also a real incident where my son, who was like two at the time, stuck a pencil in my ear. Um, he's not a bad kid. He just had, a, we were just horsing around and he put a pencil in my ear and I had to go to the emergency room. And audiometry is a test that you do for hearing to see how much damage has been, been done to your, to your hearing. So I recovered fine, so I can, I can hear. If you want to heckle me, it's fine. Um, audiometry. Because my son thinks I'm a citadel, Soundproof, a repository. Because horsing around at bedtime, he pierced my cochlea with a pencil. The first time I saw the inner ear, I thought it looked like a little life, thriving, but not yet big enough for me to feel for it any kind of empathy. By what were such things fed? Would it overgrow its carapace and make of the body a coppered bell? And then I was 16 and crossing St. Paul with my father, a seashell in his pocket, which for his own reasons he refuses to wear. 
He can't hear the Chicano keeping pace behind us, lean and loose-limbed, clucking gooks, gooks. For years, he'd sat a little further from us each night at the dinner table, hollowed out by the roll of stock tickers all through his graveyard hours. It's a remarkable machine the nurse slides into my ear canal, built to detect lies and arrhythmia and the trembling of incalculable tranches of earth. I pulled his pace toward mine, but declined to parse his solitude for him. Plains of salt haloed stone, refusing to let footfalls cut to their holdings. I said salt halo because you know the the old street lights were uh, sodium lights, those yellow sodium lights that they're starting to change over, at least in the Twin Cities, to uh, halogen lights. Now, so now the light's white, which is looks completely different. The city looks different at night. So this sort of yellow orange glow, there's like a whitish glow to it. Um, so now, um, uh, some of the poems I, I want to talk about. Uh, there's poems that talk about my uncles, as Noel introduced. Um, actually, I only interviewed one of my uncles because the other two are no longer with us. Um, one died, he was killed while being arrested by the Marcos um, secret police. And the other one um, died after he, he fled the, the Philippines and continued to resist from the US and then went back to the Philippines and he died peacefully, thank God, um, uh, later. But I only got to interview one of my uncles. Uh, but I wanted to talk about the Marcoses and just have the context of the Philippine-American War because it's a war that we never talk about. And the poems in here, by hearing, trying to hear and listen to the language and my own separation from the language, I wanted to hear this complicated history that we have between the Philippines and America and many other countries too. Um, so this poem, besides uh, the tulip poems, there's a series of island poems. And Sorry, let me just find it. This poem's called Island of Fault Lines. And there's a lot of references to different uh, things that have happened in, in the Philippines here. Um, Tojo was a military ruler of, of Japan when Japan occupied the Philippines. McKinley was the president who um, claimed that God spoke to him while he was uh, pacing and saying, what should we do about the Philippines? And he said God told him to Christianize the Philippines. In other words, invade and take people who are actually being Catholicized already after 500 years of colonization by Spain and say, well, no, actually, now we're going to bring some of the Baptists in. We're going to build American schools. And, um, um, and uh, there's some types of rifles that are named here. And um, I guess I just don't, don't want to over-explain, but smokeless was a kind of gunpowder that it was invented right at the time of the Philippine-American War. And it just was one of the technological superiorities that the American forces had besides uh, human power, the number of soldiers they had, they also had technologies like this. You could fire a cannon. You couldn't tell what direction it came from because there was no smoke. Um, so Filipinos used guerrilla warfare and a lot of tactics that were later used in Vietnam, hiding among civilian populaces. And, and the Americans used a lot of tactics that they would use in the Philippine-American War, hamleting, like uprooting whole villages so they couldn't provide food to the guerrillas, uh, killing all the livestock, um, and then hurt, hurting people together in these hamlets um, actually, it was called a reconcentration in the Philippine American War. It's called hamleting in Vietnam. Um, disease spread rapidly, famine spread rapidly too. So there was as many as is it two million? Is the, the estimate of Filipinos who lost their lives? That's the, the upward estimate. The minimum estimate, I think, is eight hundred thousand. Um, this is called Island of Fault Lines. It was Tojo. It was McKinley. It was Mauser and Craig and Arisaka and 300 years of brands and chalices. It was rain and the collarbones of women bloomed by heat and miscegenation. It was shoes. It was corrugated iron. It was homegrown and inequitable. It was nephews, friends of friends, the good life that wanted to keep on keeping. It was smokeless. It was capital. It was the logic of the emerging global market. It was ramping up, bleeding, the prepared for guest called away across the water. It was called across the water, but still it was not American. It followed this form, A, wandering, B, acceptance, C, cast out again. It was hungry, 
It went to meetings. It spent a tenth of a day's wages to dance with riot and exclusion. It was not American. It learned how to swim, but could still remember not knowing how to swim and drowned. It was evening. It sat at the bottom of the Pacific and listened to its eyes being eaten. Um, so there's a little bit of Philippine American war references there, but this poem that I'm going to read next has, so this is Filipino soldiers uh, fighting American soldiers on this side. Um, and um, this is a famous political cartoon that I think Gina mentioned this at our reading in, in Washington, D.C. Um, a few weeks ago. Um, there was a, a famous massacre called the Balangiga Massacre where the Filipino guerrillas were really successful in killing off a lot of American soldiers. And furious with this General Jacob H. Smith, and then H was a, his nickname was Howling, Howling Wilderness Smith, because he wanted to, he's like Sherman, he's just like not just defeat the enemy, but burn everything and destroy it. Um, he famously said, kill everyone over the age of 10, because, um, kill every boy over the age of 10 is what he meant. He thought that they were all a threat, although there's also a record of Filipino women who fought as well. Um, but this is a famous political cartoon that uh, was in um, the American papers of, of these blindfolded boys who are standing before a firing squad, and the only crime they committed was that they're older than the age of 10 um, and seen as a potential threat. So this poem uh, is called uh, McKinley Praying, and it talks about that, uh, I just mentioned that thing about President McKinley claiming that he had been spoken to by God and God had told him to go ahead and invade the Philippines. Okay, oh, and there's two epigraphs to it. One of them is from D.H. Lawrence, who has this great book called Studies in Classic American Literature. And he says, outside the egg of my allness chuckles the greasy little Eskimo. Outside the egg of Whitman's allness, too. Uh, offensive, but he's critiquing Whitman's idea that there's you know, I am everything, and saying that like people like uh, these marginalized groups were sort of still pushed outside of this idea, this egg of allness that he has. Um, and the other epigraph is kill everyone over 10, which is from this image. Sometimes like a sultan, I put on a disguise and walk among the people. The women have Modigliani faces, the men wear nooses of fire. I try to tell the soldiers that every insurrecto they grease is Walt Whitman, but they're getting angry and righteous since he won't lie down or be licked. I cover him with a blanket I've just bought from a chuckling Eskimo. It is many colored and uninfected by smallpox. A murderer lurks among the stalls, but I do nothing to stop him. He's the president disguised as an actor. You can tell by his yellow teeth. One by one, he kills my incarnations while they browse for souvenirs for my 6,000 siblings who have gone overseas for work. From his hand, he unfurls a bandage long enough to blindfold every bronze-skinned boy over the age of 10. They cock their heads as if listening. I hear footsteps behind me. This is my last life, a vintage courtesy of a foreign power, ready to drink and black. From the window of a Nipah hut, some kind of Indian offers me a wreath. McKinley was assassinated in 1902, and um, his assassin disguised his gun in a bandage, pretending that his hand was wounded, and he shot him at the International Exposition here in New York. Um, <clears throat> okay. Now, um, I'm going to read a couple poems about these uncles, and then I'll, I'll finish with some Tula poems. Um, So this is a funny picture of me, but this is this is a, a, a memorial in uh, Quezon City called uh, the Bantog Nang Bayani Center. The uh, it's a memorial for heroes. It's a beautiful memorial and a museum as well, and um, an educational center. And on on this wall are the names of of uh, martyrs who were uh, fighting against the Marcos dictatorship and regime. And um, uh, this is my uncle's name. Gaston, Gaston Artigas, he's one of my uncles who's deceased. Uh, he was actually a, a professor at AIM, thank you. And he was a, a business professor. He's a Ford, Ford fellow. Um, 
I applied for a Ford. I was turned down. I'm, I'm very, I think it's awesome that he was a Ford fellow. Um, but he also was helping uh, publish an underground newspaper. Um, and he fled the Philippines on, f I think he, he walked a great way um, in, in Mindanao to get out of the Philippines and eventually you know, resettled in the U.S. and continued to support the opposition. Um, I have another uncle on this wall, Virgil Ortigas, who is 19 years old, I think. Um, I have a, a clip here. But this is my third uncle, Uncle Fluellen Ortigas, who um, was in prison for, I can't remember if it's five or six years that he was imprisoned as a political prisoner and much of it in solitary confinement. And so that's mentioned in these poems too. But um, he, is, he has taken me around Manila, um, elsewhere, um, indoctrinated me <laughs> in a lot of good ways. Um, he, was, he was a communist um, and an opposition member. And then when he came back to the Philippines in the 90s, he started a gold mine. He was a sort of a capitalist. But he, uh, he's an interesting figure. This poem is loving, lovingly for him. It's called The Silverest Tongue in the Philippines. But he actually, when he was a student at the University of the Philippines, he uh, um, won an award for rhetoric, and he was invited to go speak in Manila. And he did, and the president was seated, I think, in the same uh, stand with him, and he, he basically chewed out Pres President Marcos, like accused him of corruption. So um, he wasn't arrested, I don't know how long after that, but he was also an aide to uh, Aquino, Senator Aquino. And so I have a picture of him with Nino Aquino after this, but he... Uh, yeah, he, was, he had some stones, and he still does, but this is about him, because he's a very gifted speaker. He won that award for speaking, but he, he could smooth talk anybody. Um, and it takes its form, this poem from Jess Winder Bolina, who has a poem called The Tallest Building in America, but this is called The Silver's Tongue in the Philippines. I can hear my uncle muttering in the stillness of his cell, bad-mouthing Aguinaldo, reciting Marx and Mao. He has the sharpest tongue in the Philippines. It's why His Excellency the President hates him and why his doomed brother worships him. I can hear him all the way from Bloomington, wheedling inside cowrie shells, ice build up in our gutters. I won't be born for years, but my ears are preternaturally sharp. His brother drops out of school and joins the partisans in Antigua, picks up where he left off, agrarian politics and explosives. Or maybe it's his cellmate who has the deadliest tongue in the Philippines. But my uncle is alone. It's the silence I call his cellmate because he has to give it space, be wary of its moods. It's big and oppressive, solitary. He balls up inside minutes, fissures the spoon dug tunnel of his throat. Even the shrikes were supposed to angle in and give sucker shy away. It's appropriate, probably for him. <laughs> That's okay. I thought, I thought President Trump was arriving here. I don't know. <laughs> he meets me at the terminal in aviators in a black BMW. Even I can tell, although I hardly speak the language. He has the silverous tongue in the Philippines. Bus boys, shop girls, investors, bureaucrats, even the cop he U-turns illegally in front of. They blush chuckle, kowtow, make promises to look out for his nephew who has the most leaden tongue in the Philippines. We meet his friends in a lounge of the Shangri-La. Oysters, live music, really good oysters by the way. He doesn't drink but talks and grows younger as he does so. Younger even than I. He has the most golden tongue in the Philippines. He wins an award for rhetoric and the palace invites him to fly out and speak. But he gets up, lashes out at the president seated behind him, speaks storm surge, speaks outrage, speaks velocity and eruption. Now his words are getting muffled. The blizzards that give birth to me are whiting out his cell. He's spellbound, horrified. Something's finally gotten his tongue. He can hear a jeep 300 miles away muttering up to a checkpoint, soldiers placing the faces. His brother makes a break for it, but drops what he's tucked in his shirt. The blast doesn't kill him, but is followed by a sudden report, a firearm making more silence in a dazed and speechless country. I think we've been pretty dazed for the last couple of months, but we're not speechless, right? 
Um, that's, that's Uncle Phil, and a few years ago with Nino Aquino III, he was an aide to Ninoy's father, who was um, assassinated famously when he returned to the Philippines to challenge uh, Marcos. Um, and this is Virgil Ortigas, the one who was shot and killed. This is his page on the Bantan Bayani um, site. Um, yeah, he, he went to, to uh, study the Sakatas with other students. Um, they left, they dropped out of the Central Philippine University and they were trying to encourage people to vote. And then um, the secret police were looking for them and they identified them and they, he ran um, and was shot. Um, and um, this is a, a bit of good news. Um, my aunt emailed a few days ago to say that um, the Human Rights Victims Claims Board in the Philippines just released the first 4,000 names of uh, approved claims for human rights violations and my, uh, my uncles are, are on that list. So um, finally, after all these years, they've been um, officially recognized as uh, victims of human rights violations. Um, but um, it's pretty hot here. I'm just going to read a, a few of these poems from the Tula series, and then I, I can't wait to hear Susan speak. Um, the, the poem starts with the speaker trying to speak to his grandfather who he's never met. He's, it's kind of an invocation to, um, you know, like in a classic epic poem, you invoke an angel or the gods, but it's a grandfather he's never met. Um, and then it moves to th consider his mother. So I'm going to read just a few of those poems. Um, Tula. An immigrant's son, I have ears like the blind. Music comes easily. Night frightens me. Home late from the hospital, she comes to my door. I fake sleep. She sings a soothing song in a language I never learned. Prayers against rain, catalog of mythic birds. As many names for music as English has for theft. Using them, I invent a country with only two citizens. The word I choose for mother sounds like the one for dream. Tula. One night, I am my grandfather. It's summer, no wind. My daughter has found work and love in another world. The pictures of her son look almost white. Her political brother's in prison. The youngest floats face down in a river. It's a season of abduction. God is under house arrest. Doors hang open. The day before, I saw a man so heavy with blood, his soul couldn't rise out of his body. I should send word I'm dying, but no one can move, not even to wipe the sweat from their eyes. Noon, not a sound. Even the songbirds are under martial law. Just one or two more. Um, I want to end, maybe, I hope it's not false, but a little optimistically. Um, while I was writing this book, it took me many years, um, I had two children. And besides sticking a pencil in my ear, they, uh, they've been... Um, They've completely changed my world, and um, um, I can't teach them Tagalog. It would be like teaching them, they'd have a funny accent at least from hearing me speak, but um, um, my wife is Japanese-American, uh, and so we're, she's trying to teach them Japanese at the same time. But um, I have a series of poems in here that are called Hele, because I, I looked up the word for lullaby in, in, um, in a, a dictionary, and so this poem, Gloss, um, there are several words that mean lullaby, but some don't. I'm just try to trick people with some of these words. Um, there's sort of false definitions too. Oh, I think I have an image of it, so you can see. It's, I have an open field poem, so let me see here. Yeah, it looks like this. It's called gloss, because gloss can mean both glossary, but it's also, the root means tongue. As many words for lullaby as English has for wave, breaker, ripple, roller, Swell, surge, sound. Healy, also envy. Lulai, island prayer. May you still, may you strengthen. May your thrashing turn to heft. Hele, mispronounced as heel. Wakefulness, a wound. Kantang Pampatulog. 
incantation bearing song's Roman root, cantata, cantabile. Indigenized by K, but also that much closer to Ithaca. Oyayi, altos in Batangas, lull with a huluna. Huluna, spare in text, but rich in fioriture. Ala ala, waves are part of it, waves and a rhythm. Cochli, eardrum, a loan word, cartilage and blood peel. No need for it to be returned. Katapusan, archipelago, archipelago, I scribe a sea stone in your ear. And thank you so much for me. I'm gonna read one last poem. Uh, this is also called Hele, and this is for my son. Um, who I tried to sing to every night when he was in the womb, so that way he'd know who I was if he could see when he was born, because when you're born, you can't see. I just want him to know my voice. Um, Hele. Little monsoon, little fist and groundswell, they lay you out in naked light, tagged like an ashy thrush. Little stroke, blood peel, riptide displaced by a scissor kick. There are no more oceans to cross. Just the same will let you go. But not today. Today, you are a room, words crisp as fresh cut eyelids. Today, you are a bell pitched just high of mine, so that when I sound, we sway like boats. No blood conduction, no diastole. Still, you recognize the shoreline, unshrouded, beaten bronze. What we sang to you each night. You fold it in your hand. It cools, keeps, even far out of earshot, deep in a churring, shoreless continent. Thank you very much. Glamming Salamat, Chris. Thank you very much. Okay, so our next speaker is Susan Kimpo. She is the co-author of the book, co-author and co-editor of the book, Subversive Lives, a Family Memoir of the Marcos Years. She will share her experiences of working against the Marcos dictatorship in the Philippines between 1972 to 1986, and current efforts to resist the restoration of the Marcos family back to power today. As the youngest of 10 siblings, seven of whom were active in the anti-Marcos struggle, she watched her brothers and a sister as they are drawn into the anti-dictatorship movement, eventually finding themselves pursued by the Marcos police and military. Five of her siblings were arrested, heavily tortured and incarcerated without charges filed against them. A brother who left for school to file for graduation mysteriously disappeared. Another brother was found dead in a rice paddy with seven bullet wounds. Thirty years later, the dictator's son and namesake nearly wins the vice presidency in last year's elections, and the dictator himself was reinterred in the hero cemetery. As a newly elected populist president, Rodrigo Duterte supports the Marcos's bid for power. Susan will talk about the rising tide of authoritarianism that once again threatens to engulf the Philippines. Susan holds graduate degrees in journalism and Southeast Asian studies from Ohio University, completed the writing program at Columbia University, and holds a postgraduate diploma in arts for health training from Hibernia College. Okay, so uh, friends, let's all welcome Susan Kimpo. Um, good. Um, good.
Good afternoon, and thank you for coming. Um, I see quite a number of my friends here, and uh, some I haven't seen in 10 years. So it's, it's really a big surprise for me, and I'm very, very thankful for, for your coming, and also for Asian American Writers Workshop, who, when I was living in New York in the early 90s, I saw it come in peace together, and I came to some of your readings, actually. And now I'm here um, on stage, and this is such a... You know, this is such a treat for me. Thank you very much. So, I'm uh, unlike Chris and maybe most of the people who come to AAWW, I'm not doing a reading because, um, one, I think I'm a better storyteller if I just talk to you from my heart, no? Um, and so, the title of our book is Subversive Lives, and um, uh, it, the, the title's so small there, so, uh, but that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Noel. <laughs> okay. And it's a family memoir. It took 23 years to write because it was so painful to try to piece together um, the story of a family that went through martial law. These are some pictures of martial law. Um, and the pictures are very, very memorable because some of them I took and others are taken by my cousin. All the pictures that you see here, I was there. I was, um, I would, I was a, a witness, a first-hand witness. But I think um, because of the, the limited time also, um, and I don't want to, to take up much of your Sunday, uh, this, the martial law is very real to me because it um, immediately calls to mind the story of a family, my family. And this is the picture of my family, and that's me between my mother and my father. Um, my father, uh, like Chris's dad, came from Iloilo no? and worked in, Uli in Iloilo, which is an island uh, quite far from Manila. But when my brother Ryan was born, he was one year, so, one year old and he contracted polio. And it was necessary for the family to move to, um, to Manila where he needed uh, five operations before the age of 10. As you can see, I come from a really big family, <laughs> the youngest of uh, 10. And if whoever in the audience is, um, you know, the youngest also in their families. You know how it is to fight off others to use the bathroom, right? <laughs> okay, so my, my father was a very um, hardworking man, um, an engineer for Coca-Cola, you know, Coca-Cola bottling company, and the worst thing you could do in our household was to bring home a bottle of Pepsi. <laughs> Seriously, he got really mad. So soda was okay, you know, but just not Pepsi. <laughs> so. I will start with my story with uh, our first home. Okay. okay, our first home in Manila, which happened to be very close to um, uh, Malacanang, no? which is the presidential palace. And why is that? Because the girls went to a school called College of the Holy Spirit, which is a girls' school, and right across the street was San Beda College, a boys' school. And, um, and, and so we went there, all uh, 12 of us, and we lived in this rickety old house where, um, a, you know, a permanent fixture in the bathroom was a, a spider as big as a, a man's hand. No? I soon befriended it. Um, uh, but this here is um, me, three years old, looking like Dora the Explorer. Um, this is my brother Ryan, the boy with polio, my eldest sister Liz, and the story starts with Ronald John, who is my brother behind the grill gate. Um, this is a picture of Ronald John when he was in the sixth grade, and he, um, he came home one day uh, with very good news. Um, he, he said to my, far, my father that uh, he had passed the entrance exam to a very elite science high school, the Philippine Science High School, which was a big deal because it was the only science high school in the country at that point that had free tuition, free board and lodging, and a little stipend for you. And, um, and imagine having to pay uh, um, for the tuition of 10 children. This was definitely um, a relief for my parents, no? But when Ronald John came to the high school, this is the high school be behind him, the high school then did not exist. What existed was um, a warehouse wherein the, the roof would leak, and he said he had to fight off rats 
before you could sit down and have your lesson. And all the seats would like wobble because one foot of the chair or table would be shorter than the rest. But the, the worst thing he said was that it was a science high school, but when you needed a Bunsen burner and a test tube to heat up something, there was no test tube. Instead, they gave you a Coke bottle. You know? <laughs> then it wasn't plastic, okay? <laughs> they gave you a Coke bottle and that's where you use, uh, that's what you use to heat up um, chemicals. And so um, Ronald John and his classmates, uh, that's him in the uh, white shirt, went to the principal and said, what is this? We're supposed to be in the premier science high school in the country, and we can't even buy test tubes. And the principal said, you know, don't look at me. I'm just, uh, you know, I just work here. Um, I'm a public servant, and uh, the public, the, this particular science high school is actually under the office of the president of Marcos, no? Ferdinand Marcos himself. So if you have any complaints, then go over to Marcos, no? And because they were good boys and girls, they went over to Marcos. <laughs> okay. So if you look at the kids, the pictures, no, they're very young. That that should be a boy about 13 years old, right? And um, they were freshman high school, and they had Philippine Science High School (PSHS), a government neglect. This government is bureaucracy, and they even had a picture, an effigy of Marcos that they burned. No, so. Uh, speaking of uh, starting young, <laughs> um, they really started young. And what happened was that um, when they got there, they found out that it wasn't just them who were complaining against uh, Marcus and about the education system, but every single day there would be a rally outside Malacanang or the presidential palace or Congress or the U.S. Embassy, usually a number a number of students from uh, anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 students were there. What was happening? It was the first quarter storm, no? and the people in the audience who are as old as me would probably know what that is. Um, they said it was like a storm of 1970, the first quarter, January, February, March, because the students were all out uh, picketing and rallying, protesting government for several reasons. Um, there was a huge uh, typhoon, and the typhoon would take several lives, and you would see pictures in the newspapers, and I remember it, that the, only the tops of the coconut trees would be seen because the flooding was so um, devastating and people would be on top of their houses reaching out to helicopters for food. And next to that, you would see a picture of Imelda Marcos with her shoes, like on the poster, and uh, a, a, you know, a tiara of uh, emeralds or uh, diamonds. So they were partying on a yacht, while, uh, while the country was suffering from a major typhoon. And so there was a lot of this, um, already a disconnect for the Marcuses, not really listening to the needs of the pe people. Also, Marcus was also very much supportive of the war in Vietnam, um, having, giving the Americans full use of two large military bases um, in the Philippines, Clark Air Base and Subic Naval, Naval Base. Um, Clark is the size of the entire state of Singapore. No? So you can imagine how much military action was happening there. So we would see young men, uh, young Americans, uh, many of them in their early 20s or even 19 or 18, coming in from America, coming to uh, Clark and Subic, and we all thought they were guapo, no? <laughs> they were good looking. Um, and then they would leave for Vietnam and come back in body bags. No? because I think 55,000 American youth uh, died in Vietnam, in, in the Vietnam War. And then Marcus started saying, well, we should send our troops to Vietnam and to fight under the American flag. So you can just imagine the young men in the universities freaking out. It was like, but they come back in body bags, you know, we don't want that. And so they would protest. No? So a lot of things, the, um, the uh, Marcus's, um, uh, insensitivity to the needs of the people, uh, the Vietnam War, and Marcus's pandering to the Americans, and the lavish lifestyle of the Marcuses that we would see in the newspapers. And it was already, of course, the, the beginning of how he was already stealing from the people. And um, so this was the first activist in, the, um, in, the, uh, in, our, um, in our family. No? 
This is a picture, a very old one. As you can see, it's very yellowed. But this is the um, Philippine Science High School, the high school of my brother, marching off to Malacanang. No? And I'd like to point out, again, look at the young faces. These guys are 13, 14, 15. And over here is Francis Sontiliano. If you stretched out the picture, my brother would be standing here, okay? Because he was standing close to Francis Sontiliano on this march. This is Francis Sontiliano, 15 years old, a Philippine Science High School uh, student. And he was, um, like my brother, the very first one who was um, in his family who got into this elite uh, science high school, the first one in his family to be studying in Manila. But that morning, 15-year-old Francis was already um, late. No? He woke up, and the bus that was taking the students to the rally to the palace, presidential palace, the driver was already honking his horn. And um, everyone was inside, the, the bus, the faculty, and the students leaving for the, uh, the rally. The faculty would accompany the minors. No? And um, Francis ran, and he did not have time to put on his shoes. When they were marching towards the palace, they passed by Quiapo Boulevard, which is um, um, a, a wide boulevard going to the palace. Uh, a security guard took a, a gerber bottle, you know, um, you know, the baby food, and um, emptied it out, put in gunpowder and little bits of uh, nails into the bottle, sealed it tightly, and with intent, he went up to the fourth floor of a building and threw it, you know, without really thinking, into the crowd. Huh? Of course, the bottle heads on, falls on uh, uh, the head of uh, Francis Sontiliano, and within seconds, he has half a head. Okay, and he falls down, and this is a picture of him, um, his head now covered with a placard, and that's his chinelas, or his slippers, because like I said, he did not have the time, the time to put on his shoes. So Francis dies, age 15, and it is 1970. It is not even martial law. No? Um, the following day, December 5, 1970, a group of students, including Ronald John Kimpo, my brother, uh, is giving a press conference to the uh, media talking about the death of Francis Ontiliano. And Ronald John was uh, very close to him, and at this point he's 16. And, um, and the the high school becomes very, very politicized. And if, in fact, quite nearly everyone was not going to school anymore, including the professors, and they were just meeting each other in the streets, no? in, in protest rallies. What happened was Ronald John, my brother, eventually graduated and went into uh, the University of the Philippines, basically, the, supposedly at that time, the best uni public um, university there was. And um, when he entered, uh, UP, or the University of the Philippines, martial law is declared, no? And he was then, um, I think, a sophomore or a, a freshman. He was 19, a little older than the rest because high school was five years then for uh, Philippine Science High School. But at age 19, um, during martial law, this is what happens, no? If Chris and I were studying for an exam, and we were, I would ask Chris, hey, Chris, do you understand... Um, chemistry problem set number one. And he says, oh, I don't know anything about problem set number one. So we go to Noel. And so the three of us try to figure out the chemistry problem. So one, two, three people talking inside a university, you are arrested because that is considered illegal assembly. Okay? So any, th any gathering more than two people is considered a threat to Marcos. No? Why is that? Because by then, by the time Marcos had announced um, in 1972 publicly the declaration of martial law, he already had 50,000 of his uh, enemies inside prison. And the only enemies left that were uh, left to question his rule would be students, no? primarily student activists. But they couldn't tell who, because one student looks like Another student, you know, they're all in jeans. They all have long hair. <laughs> they all don't comb their hairs, you know. <laughs> they're all in uh, uh, chinelas or slippers. And, um, and so what happened was that there was a contest in, um, among the police and among the military to catch as many activists as you can. 
So if you take an activist, you get it's immediately something like 3,000 to 5,000 pesos, which is um, approximately, uh, how much is that? Um, sorry? Okay, 60 to $100 per person. And this was 1972, okay? And so um, they did that. No? So my brother John, at one point, he said um, they needed to study. They needed to do group work. No? So there were four of them. So what happened was um, uh, Ronald John, two boys, and a girl, Marie Hilo, met at Marie Hilo's house, very close to the university. And they were discussing, you know, sometimes they'd be eating chips and watching TV, and then they would stop and um, do a little homework, and then there was a knock on the door, on the gate. You know? When they opened the gate, there was a team of military men, about eight of them, and they were coming from um, uh, Camp Krame, one of the close military camps. They, they barged in, no warrants of arrest, you know? and they were saying, um, where is Wilfredo Hilao? Wilfredo Hilao was the brother of Marie, and he had gone into hiding six months prior. No? And so what happened was they said, oh, we can't go without, um, we won't get the money. We won't get the reward money for not bringing in an activist. So they looked at my brother, and they said, oh, look, he has glasses. He must be smart, okay? And so they looked at his back pocket and found an ID. And they said, oh, he studies at the University of the Philippines. He is smart, you know? And then one guy said, look, he's fair-skinned. Look, he has Chinese eyes, you know? He looks Chinese. This is true. This is what they said. And do you know that the Chinese come from the People's Republic of China? And the people in the People's Republic of China are communists, okay? And because he had glasses, he looked Chinese, and carried a UP ID, he was tortured. No? And how was the torture? And I'm sorry, I'm going to be a little graphic. Um, but... Um, one of the boys who was also with him said, could I use the bathroom? And the, um, the military man had the idea of let them all use the bathroom. And when it was filled, the toilet, they dunked the heads of the boys in. You know? The girl, Marie Hilo, pretended to say, oh, do, do, would you want some snacks and coffee? He said, she said to the military men. So, of course, they said yes. She crept into the kitchen and climbed out of the kitchen window and escaped. You know? But instead of taking Marie, because she wasn't there anymore, they took her sister, no? who was 23 years old, and who just happened to be studying in the room upstairs. That evening, there was a curfew, and Ronald John, my brother, age 19, did not come home. No phone calls. They just disappear like that. You don't know what, what happens. No? And it turns out he was brought to um, Camp Krame, which is a military camp within Manila, and there... Uh, he was stripped naked. No? And for five days, he underwent uh, severe torture. Um, he was stripped naked, tied to um, um, a desk, the desk that you use for the classrooms with the little uh, desk, yeah, with the little armrest. And um, he was stripped down to his socks and his briefs. And then a blindfold was covered, uh, covering his eyes. And then they put very, very strong uh, lights like this, no? um, spotlights, very close to his face, no? about three inches away for five days. So he said, if you pressed onto my cheek, it felt like a uh, crispy lechon, no? like, uh, because it was already very burned. No? And so they would ask him, uh, so who, um, who recruited you into the revolution? And he said, what revolution? We were studying. And they would say, wrong answer. And they would clap his ears with their hands very strongly. No? And because he kept giving wrong answers, he got boxed, he got kicked. And then finally, they said, oh, you keep giving wrong answers. They took a live wire, they tied it to his genitals, and electrocuted him several times over five days. When he still did not give the right answer, whatever that was, they took a syringe um, in, and uh, filled it up with water and injected it into his testicles. No? Um, on the third night, when he and the two other boys were put in a room, there was just um, a very thin door that was uh, connecting to the next room. And um, in the other room was Liliosa Hilao, the other woman who was taken uh, from, the ho from that house. And she was 23 years old. She was, um, a very, she was going to graduate that March with, uh, as a magna cum laude. No? 
and she, um, a very promising young woman, the editor of the newspaper of the school, um, and she was crying. And my brother and the two boys were saying, Liliosa, are you okay? And Liliosa said, um, they've been hurting me, but I know tomorrow they will do it even more because now they're done with the you three boys. No? And so um, they were trying to, to, to give her enough courage and were saying, it's okay, you know, just stick to your story. We haven't done anything wrong. But instead, the following morning, uh, the men came for Liliosa. They pulled her out of the room and she said, wait, can I just use the restroom? And she went into the restroom, locked the door. And um, I know very well how that, that corridor looked like because I visited my brother later when we found him. And it was a long corridor, and at the end there was the restroom. And she had locked the door, and after a few seconds, they heard a bottle break. No? The military tried to open the door, it was locked. So they called my brother and the two boys, and they said, break down the door. When they broke down the, the door, they found Liliosa's body on the floor, um, but she had no more mouth. No? It was just a black hole. She had drank the uh, muriatic acid that was used to as a cleaning agent for the toilets um, as a suicide because she was afraid that she would be hurt even more. My brother uh, still felt a pulse. Um, she was carried by my brother and the two boys down to a jeepney to a vehicle that would take her to a hospital, but of course she died. Um, the, eventually, the, um, the muriatic acid had gone through her esophagus, and so her entire chest cavity was open. So you could see the lungs, the heart, and the, the ribs. No? This was the body that was given to her parents. So they held a wake with a closed coffin, and her captors, her military captors, came uh, on the first night with a bucket. They went to, to the mother of Liliosa and gave her the bucket, and inside the bucket um, was her innards and her brain. Okay? And that same evening, they took other members of her family to incarcerate. Huh? So what happened to Ronald John? He stayed in that detention center for, um, detention center jail, basically, uh, for another five months. Um, and at any point in time, they would pull him out again and torture him, Sometimes they would bring a young activist and say, okay, John and the two boys beat him up. And they would say, but we don't even know this guy. Why should we do anything to him? And they would say, beat him up or we will beat you up again. You know? There were cases of sodomy. Um, and very, very, um, at any one point, they will take you again and make a punching bag out of you. When, um, when Ronald John left, uh, when he was released finally, um, he, of course, had post-traumatic stress disorder, but we didn't know that, you know. We had no money for psychologists at that point. It was the 70s in the Philippines. We just knew that he would have nightmares at night. He would be kicking and screaming, and he would be falling off his bed. Um, and um, after a few months, he decided he was picking up his life, no? And decided to go back to school. So he re-enrolled in geology, um, his course in UP, um, in, at the university, and uh, went through four years of studies, no activism, um, just studying, you know. And one day, he came down, no, it was morning, and he said to me, Susan, I'm going to eat dinner here, can you leave me a little food? And I said, yeah, okay, sure. And, he, and then he says, I'm just filing for graduation. He was carrying his um, notebook, a jacket, um, his usual jeans and t-shirt, and he left. And that was October 1977, and we haven't seen him again, dead or alive. He just disappeared. So basically, a lot of people disappeared under martial law. They just left, and you don't see them. You don't get a body. That's it. So to this day, we do not know what happened to him. We just know that at that time, our house was under surveillance because the military was looking for another brother. Okay, And I'll go to... Um, this is the last picture I have of Ronald John um, on a field trip, field trip in uh, Montalban to just gather samples of rocks. No? Soon after this picture was taken, he disappeared. Um, this is my brother uh, June, no? uh, number nine. I'm number 10, so he's the brother before me. And June 
this is his high school picture. No? When he graduated from high school, he was party boy. You know, he liked girls, and the girls liked him back. Um, he had a very good voice. He was an athlete, and he would coach uh, volleyball both in uh, in his school, the boys' school, and other girls' schools. Only girls' schools. Okay, <laughs> so we never thought that he would turn out to be an activist. But the first uh, the first year he was at the university, the same university as Ronald John, he saw um, he saw an exhibit, no, and the exhibit was on. Uh, basically a slum area that Imelda had uprooted people because she wanted a, a hotel to be built or something. And so he started um, volunteering to go to that uh, slum area to teach guitar and songs so that the, um, the teenagers there could go for Christmas caroling when Christmas came. And one day the, the bulldozers came to, um, to finish off the shanties of the the slum dwellers. And so June joined the rally in protest. That evening, they took 200 people. No? And of the 200 people, they let everyone go at the end of the evening except for one person, and that was June. And why? Okay, because they found his ID and they saw his name, Kimpo. No? And they said, oh, Ishmael Kimpo Jr., you're like a family, you're like a factory of activists. No? Because by then, our f four other siblings had been already in jail, in the Marcos jail, and tortured. And simply for his name, he was beaten up for 10 days. No? When he was released, June was so angry. You know, you, you, put, um, you put an innocent boy into prison, and you beat him up, and he comes out angry, of course, right? But June was the only person in our family who decided to join the guerrillas, no? the, the New People's Army. Um, because he thought that that was the only way uh, they could stop Marcos. No? And so he disappeared for three years, and he, we would uh, just get um, little messages, little notes um, from friends who would like fold it small enough. You know how they fold it? You have to fold it very small so that if the police catches you, you, you eat it. No? So um, uh, that was part of the activist diet then. <laughs> Small notes. Yeah. <laughs> so I know quite a lot of people who've had to, drink, to eat this thing. Um, so June would send us notes and it would say, I'm fine, don't worry. If you have extra money or medicine, please send it. You know? And after three years, we had uh, news that June was found in a, in a morgue, in a, in a funeral parlor in Nueva Ecija, which is a province four hours away. And so three of my sisters go to try to get um, to see if that's really his, um, his body there. And my sister said, Susan, you couldn't even walk through this morgue because there were bodies, you know, left and right on the floor, on the chairs, on the tables. There were just bodies, one on top of the other. And I said, so why, why don't people, like, pick up the bodies, you know? And, and she said, because if you do, then they... Um, they say, oh, that guy was a guerrilla, therefore you must be a guerrilla supporter or a guerrilla yourself. And so you're picked up as well by the military. Um, my sisters confused the military by speaking in um, the best English they could muster. No? And the military was confused because they said, oh, we thought we killed the peasant boy. So why are the relatives coming from Manila speaking in English? And you see, English was our main weapon against martial law, <laughs> against the military, who would be confused. No? And so while the military was discussing the case, they took the body of June and wrapped him in newspaper and brought him into the car. And um, this was the body of June that was found in Nueva Ecija. My sister was able to snitch this picture. Um, he had a hole in his forehead, close, close range shot, that went out the back of his head. There were, seven, se there were seven bullets in total, the others throughout his body. But what was interesting was that they, um, they broke his hand after death, no? After death because he wasn't holding a gun. There were, there were no powder burns, according to the autopsy. So he was unarmed. But they plugged in a gun, took pictures, and in the newspapers announced that he was leading a team of guerrillas to kill or assassinate um, a mayor in the next town. Okay, but of course that wasn't true. The autopsy showed he had no powdered burns. He was eating, and there was food 
in his mouth and his hands. No? So at least with June, age 24, Ronald John, the other brother, was 23 when he disappeared. June was 24. No? Um, like I said, my other brothers and sisters were also uh, incarcerated. Um, Ryan, the, the boy with polio, eventually had to leave and seek asylum, uh, go to different countries in Europe seeking asylum, finally getting to France that gave him political asylum. Um, uh, Nathan, valedictorian grade school, valedictorian high school, um, this is him, ends up with the military and is used as a baseball you know, by four men. He was stripped naked and hit with clubs until he would fall. You know? He was shouting, um, I'm, um, have mercy, I'm anemic, and because they said he was stripped naked. So they took his briefs and plugged it into his mouth and said, you talk too much. And they, and they said, shut up and continued the beating. He, he survived though. Uh, Lillian, was, uh, my sister, was sexually molested in prison. She was missing for two months before we, we found her. Um, Norman, a brother who was a professor at the university, was also um, incarcerated for a month. No? So um, Amnesty International reports that there were 7, 70,000 incarcerated for, the, uh, for being enemies of the state under Marcus, 30, 34,000 uh, people tortured, 3,240 killed extrajudicially, um, 398 disappeared like my brother John. No? Um, there were, in uh, May 2015, um, like Chris had mentioned earlier, uh, people were asked, um, martial law victims were asked to come out of the woodwork to file claims. No? A new law was signed by um, the former president Aquino um, Noy Noy Aquino, that would allow for reparations. And they were expecting 20,000 to file. Instead, 75,730 claimants came out of the woodwork. This is a low number, no? considering because a lot of the victims have died already or couldn't get um, to the cities to file their claims. Okay? Um, I just wanted to show you the, the uh, economic tables or the gross, national, uh, gross domestic product of the six presidents uh, before Duterte, with Marcos having a negative 7.3 gross domestic product for his last three years. No? And Pinoy, or uh, Aquino, actually that goes up to, it says here 6.5.6 um, here, but it actually goes up to something like 7.5 for the gross domestic product. Why am I showing you this? Because... <sighs> <laughs> Because when the cousin of Trump, namely <laughs> Duterte, his Filipino cousin, uh, runs for office and sets the pace for everything, uh, he runs with the help of this guy, the son of Marcos, no? and the namesake of the dictator himself. So he runs as vice president, and he runs as president, but he keeps saying, even during his campaign, that, oh, I will, you know, I'll try to wipe out uh, drugs and crime in six months, and if I don't succeed, I'll step down and have him take over the presidency. No? And publicly, he announces that it is actually Marcos' money that propped up his campaign. Okay? So imagine 2016 comes along, and all the martial law victims are still in shock. You know, We just filed our reparation claims. We haven't gotten it. And then another Marcos was running for office, no? And it was a big battle, no? Because there was the problem of historical revisionism. So in this cartoon, and I, these are all from Facebook. Uh, Pooh is eating honey, and Tigger says, sweet Jesus, Pooh, that's not honey. You're eating historical revisionism. And Pooh starts saying, Marcos is the best president the Philippines ever had, okay? And what is historical revisionism? Unfortunately, the martial martial law years isn't written in textbooks. Kids do not learn this. No? For the last 30 years after Marcos, it is not taught. We do not, children in the Philippines do not know about Marcos, about the human rights violations, that Marcos was supposedly, um, he says that he was a hero, but that's not true. So um, 
the Marcoses, using the money they stole from the Filipinos, had launched this very intensive um, social media campaign five years before 2016, you know, preparing the biggest voting bloc of uh, millennials, 18 years old, who knew nothing about the Marcos era. And he was, uh, Marcos Jr. was really wooing the millennial vote. So um, what was the historical revisionism um, line? It was saying Marcos was the best president the Philippines ever had. Ever had. It was a golden era. If Marcos stayed on, the Filipinos would have been an economic miracle like Singapore. Human rights violations were limited to a few cases that fell through the cracks, says, um, says the Marcos Jr. Marcos was a war hero with 33 medals to his credit, and Marcos didn't have to steal. He was immensely rich. Okay, So this is the lies that they were feeding the people um, during the presidential and vice presidential campaign no? for Duterte and Marcos. Um, Marcos was not a war hero. He did not have 33 medals. He had tr three, okay? One was given by the U.S. government for everyone who fought the Japanese under World War II under the U.S. flag. Another one was given by the Philippine army later on to everyone who also uh, fought under World War II. The third medal, which is the Medal of Valor, Marcos gave himself <laughs> when he became president, okay? So no medals there, okay? So this is a picture of um, uh, a meme that came out, no? And uh, the meme would say, did you know that Marcos was personally decorated by General MacArthur during World War II? This guy is really a hero. He got that medal from uh, MacArthur, but they cut off his head and inserted the head of Marcos, no? And so the opposition says, busted, Marcos was personally decorated by General MacArthur, but only in an edited photo. No? But the, the meme showing him as a hero circulated very widely. Okay? Um, this is a Facebook page of a librarian at the UP main library. Um, it's in Tagalog, but she says, hey, Marcos, apologies. Please unfriend me. You don't deserve my virtual friendship. Then come visit me at the third floor of the main library. I will ram down your throats the, the records, documents, and photos from the martial law era. Where on earth can you find police reports saying that the cause of death was suicide, supposedly, but the body was shot 27 times. Six of these were in the head, and the corpse's eyeballs were hanging from its sockets. Read reliable sources. Don't just believe memes and YouTube revisionist videos. No? So there was a lot of that. It was really a tit-for-tat on social media with uh, Marcos and Duterte hiring three call centers in China to just troll, and you thought only uh, Trump knew trolling. We were first, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because uh, Marcos and Duterte had hired three um, companies in China to troll anyone who said anything negative about him or Duterte, okay? And they would come out with fake news sites, no? Alter alternative news. Again, we were first. <laughs> and. Um, like this one saying, in just six years, Noy Noy Aquino's record of failure is now worse than all of Marcos' years. But I showed you earlier the gross domestic product, which, of course, this isn't true. And they would take pictures of the presidential candidate that was coming from the Liberal Party, the same as the, the last president, Aquino, and they would do things like this, saying, this is why I do not have a wife yet, uh, of course, in, insinuating that they were, you know, having an affair. So, um, wooing the millennial vote. This is Marcos Jr. No, <laughs> and when Rogue One, this is true. You can you can look at it at you in YouTube. When Rogue One came out, suddenly within the week he had a video at, with Marcos Jr. as a Jedi, no, complete with his flashing sword in blue, and he turns around and he says from the sand dunes of Ilocos, you know, um, I welcome you, or something like that. And then, um, and in this picture, this, he held, um, this is true, he held a contest for Valentine's, showing, saying that if you give, if you turn in your name and your email address, we will pick a date for Bongbong Marcos for uh, Valentine's, no? And 
um, he's trying to look very young, you know, because he's courting the millennial vote. So in baby blue sweater, trying to look as young as possible, the guy is older than me, and I'm 56, okay? But he was trying to, to come off as uh, young because the millennials had one-third of the entire vote, voting population, okay? So um, this is one picture from the uh, um, Marcus Home videos wherein they were singing in that yacht that I was telling you about. This is Marcus Jr., Bong Bong, with a bow tie that would flash. No? Again, this is in, in YouTube. Um, and he's singing, ironically, We Are the World, which was a song that was meant to um, raise funds for a starving Africa in the, in the middle of the 1980s. Whereas in his hometown, or, well, not his hometown, but in a province very close to uh, the hometown of Chris, his dad, was a starving child, um, and there was a famine as well. So how did we fight back? No? How can you fight Marcos, the Marcoses, with uh, stolen wealth of $10 billion at least, and a whole machinery of trolls? Um, and we had nothing. We had no money. Okay? So there were little attempts, but the little attempts would do things. Maybe you could use this against Trump. Okay? So we took the little bow tie. And this is a group of students who started to use the bow tie. And there were only six of them. This is in Cebu. Six college students brought uh, pictures of Bong Bong partying. And it says, Filipinos were starving while the Marcoses were partying. You know? um, and this became very, very dangerous for the six young men and women. Um, they were surrounded by 200 Marcos loyalists. No? This was outside a town hall wherein um, Marcos was going to give a campaign speech. And when this young people came out to try to picket his uh, speech, um, his supporters, Marcos supporters, all surrounded them, 200 versus 6, and they started pushing. You know? And the police were just laughing and watching. But they held their ground, and they started to bring out their bullhorn to try to... Um, uh, say things, but it was grabbed from them. So what they did was they just stood there holding their picture. And the press saw that 200 people had gathered around them, and Marcos, um, Bong Bong Marcos lost all his media coverage because they came to instead cover the six young people. Okay? So that's how we won that, that particular fight. Okay. Um, we cre created a video, uh, well, five videos, five short videos, because the Marcoses had made so many videos that would twist um, history. So we created a video, and the, in the video would be uh, the truth about martial law and aspects about torture under martial law. For, that, for the five videos, for every single day, we would get uh, 150 negative comments every single day. You know? There were five admin administrators of the site, and all we did was delete, ban user, delete, you know, because it was all just trolls coming in. The day immediately after the elections, we received two negative comments. Okay? So you know that it was really just trolling. When we found out that we were losing the social media, me, uh, I say we, um, it, it's not a, a group that's organized. It's like small pockets of resistance. Um, when we found out that we were losing the social media uh, battle, we decided to go into schools and colleges, and, and that's me in uh, Mindanao State University. So I gathered five martial law victims, and we would meet with anyone and anyone, um, just anyone, um, students, teachers, uh, um, you know, I even went to a candy factory to talk to the uh, workers to talk about the, the ills of martial law and to uh, battle um, historical revisionism. So we would get, this is May Rodriguez, uh, the head of Bantayog ng mga bayani, and she was also part of the group. And um, we would speak to anywhere from uh, um, 20 people to 1,000 students. No? And we, we solicited some money, and we just kept going until the money ran out. No? And this is in Visayas. No? In this particular school, 800 came to listen. Okay? And with that, because we created so much noise, the martial law victims, 
we got on TV with Boy Abunda. I don't know if you know that guy. But um, this guy is a, a, a talk show host. Um, he would usually just talk to celebrities, you know, about um, uh, who's going out with who and who smacked who or whatever. But he gave uh, a good two hours to the martial law issue. And we would get as much as possible, as much media as we could. And it worked pretty well. Okay. So Bong Bong Marcos thankfully lost the election. Okay. And, um, and he said uh, immediately the day after the elections, um, he says, Bong Bong Marcos says, we should guard our votes because the only way I will lose on Monday, election day, is if they, his opponent, um, Lenny Robredo, cheats, you know. And then he says, Occupy Luneta, which is a huge people's park, and wear a red shirt. So May 11, the day of Occupy Luneta comes, <laughs> and they, instead they occupy a tree. Okay? <laughs> so there were only about 100 people in red shirts. Okay? So um, then we were again pressed with a different, um, immediately, you know, 2016 was horrible. Uh, immediately after Duterte won the presidency, he announced that he was going to um, put the dictator in the hero cemetery and turn him there. And again, these are the martial law victims, very, very old now, coming out into the Supreme Court, pleading the Supreme Court in the rain several, weekly. We were organizing weekly protest marches to ask the Supreme Court to um, judge uh, against the burial of Marcos in the... Um, in the Hero Cemetery. And this is one rally in the rain. 3,000 of us came out, no? But in, amidst a typhoon, this was probably one of the biggest already that we could muster. Can I have the video, please? Let's see, Tracy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I just want you to watch this. Nakapektuhan ako ng martial law. Nakulong ako ng anim na buwan at kalahati sa ano, sa karami. Habang ako ay sumisigaw, hindi naririnig ng iba. Kunti kibot lang, nagkaroon ako ng kaso. I was a rape victim. Doon din ako nakaramdam na talagang mababa ang tingin ng lipunan sa anang mga kalalakihan sa babae. Mabuti pa yung basahan na na wawash mo clean, pero yung tao parang mahirap yatang linisin. Ako din ay minolestia sexually. Libingan na ito ay itinalaga para sa mga bayani. At hindi namin kailanman maituturing si Marcos bilang isang bayani. Sa dami ng pagpapahirap niya, no? ilang dekada na pinahirapan niya ang ating bansa, ilang libo ang kanyang ipinapatay at ay pinakulong. No? Paano natin siya tatawaging isang bayani? sinisimbolo ng mga bato na dadalhin diyan sila yung mga sila yung mga pinahirapan ng martial law ang dala kong bato ay dalawa no yung bato para kay Jun Kim po at yung bato para kay Ronald John Kim po mga kapatid ko po uh, sa tingin ko po sila po yung bayani uh, kaya gusto ko na pong unahan yung imbis na ho yung bangkay ni Marcos ang ilagay doon sana ho yung bangkay na lang ng mga kapatid ko Ang buong sandaigdigan ay nakakaalam kung ano ang nangyari noong panahon ng martial law sa Philippines. Isang diktador si Marcos na hindi dapat tularan ng kabataan. Sana po maulit ng ibang tao. No? Sana magawa nila itong pag-aalay ng mga bato na may pangalan ng mga martyrs and heroes kung saan-saan nagkaroon po ng struggles against the dictatorship nung panahon na yon uh, At saka sana po ay ulit-ulitin to ng mga mamamayang Pilipino para ipakita nila na hindi pa nila nakakalimutan ang mga krimen ni Marcos at higit sa lahat, hindi nila nakakalimutan ng mga tunay na bayani.
sana mas dumami pa tayo para maging ma uh, malindaw at maging matatag ang ating pakibaka laban kay Marcos noong panahon na yun. Kaya ngayon, tutulan natin. Could we go back to the slide? So we created this video immediately after um, Duterte announced that he was going to um, uh, bury Marcos, no? And the it was a small act of protest to to put stones in um, in the graveyard that was for Marcos with the names of the martial law heroes. And what happened was it took on, and other schools and students and people in different cities started to lay stones and take pictures and posted it on Facebook. Uh, so much so that they got angry and they covered up the um, the um, the would be tomb. And they disallowed anybody who did not have relatives in the public cemetery to go. No? But that did not stop us. Um, I just, oh, these are pictures of people who died under martial law. No? If you look at, this is Liliosa Hilo, the woman I said was, um, uh, her, um, her innards were put in a, Yeah, her innards were put in, in a bucket and given to her mother. She was 23. And if you look at the ages of the, the people who were killed or disappeared then, hardly anyone. It's, it's 26, 21, 25, 23, 24, 16, 21. Hardly anyone uh, was over the age of 30. No? So you had an entire generation of uh, people who died in their youth. And a whole generation of leaders was gone also. So now we have Bongbong Bong Marcos and Duterte left um, to pick from. So we wrote, oh, that's the title of the book. Okay. So we wrote Subversive Lives, a family memoir of the Marcos years, to let the, the youth of today know that under Marcos' rule, there was a dictatorship, that there was a revolution, not by a few, but by millions of Filipinos. Often we say, you know, oh, the Filipinos are great. They, um, they uh, ousted a dictator in three days without shedding blood. No? I would say and I would argue that the bloodletting started with the death of young Francis Sontigliano at age 15 in 1970, even before martial law started. And certainly it was not a bloodless revolution. Um, I lost two brothers, he lost an uncle, and many more. No? And uh, the struggle to defend democracy so hard sought by the martial law martyrs continues to this day because now fascism is again on the rise both here and other places in the world and especially with Duterte back home and um, and one reason I've been going around it's not really to sell the book you know the book will just sell itself if it's any good but to tell Filipino communities of what's happening back home because we again have to defend democracy um, I would just like to end with this one uh, video, please. Could the, and I'll translate uh, some parts that are in Tagalog. We thought that uh, the millennials did not care, but when Marcos was uh, buried, this happened. Why is that? Why are we reacting when we were not even alive during martial law? Why are we so angry? You do not need first-hand experience to know how people feel and to be patriotic.
Marcos Hitler dictator lapdog of the Americans Duterte Duterte Marcos is no hero The money of the Marcoses should be taken from them, out of their control. The Duterte government should take it back and use it for the people. We ch challenge Duterte, choose the Marcoses or the people. Marcos Marcos is a thief. This is a comedian. Um, representing uh, Imelda Marcos. You do not know, you youth. You do not know. The court system has disappointed us. The system has disappointed us. You, you alone, you alone can stop the Marcoses. It is just the ordinary folk who can stop the Marcoses. Where is the millennial? Here on EDSA rallying. And you thought you were first. The people now are fighting. We should not fall asleep. We should be awake. We are told change is coming. But if real change is coming, real change will not come from one single person. We should not allow that just one person will make a decision for all of us. Real change should come from all of us, not just one man. Honk for justice. Ukayan means dig up the corpse of Marcos.
Thank you. And uh, Duterte has again and again repeated that he will declare martial law. Um, and, uh, and of course, we are all scared. We know that Aimee Marcos, the daughter of uh, the dictator, is running for senator next year. And in 2022, that one of the Marcos children will run for the presidency. So um, we are all very, very uh, bewildered, the, the, the martial law victims in particular. But we hope that you too will say never again to martial law. Maraming salamat. Thank you, Susan. That was very enlightening. Uh, I'd like to in invite both Chris and Susan on stage for a brief um, discussion, and then we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. OK, so l let me start with, with a question, OK? It's about the family. The family is big. in among Filipinos. It's almost sacred. Okay, next to the activists and victims, however, it is the families who bore the brunt of the brutal regime of Marcos's martial law. It had a lasting impact or legacy on Filipino families, both in the Philippines, as in the case of Susan's, and those in the diaspora, like in the case of Chris's. So I'll ask both of you how was the writing process? I mean, for you, Susan, how did you relieve the ordeal that your family went through? And for you, Chris, how was it to try to imagine what your uncles went through? So. Hello? Oh, good. Um, I think for me, um, by the way, Susan, that was, that was so powerful. That was just, yeah, I'm just, I'm kind of speechless right now. <laughs> um, I, 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 a lot of the stories um, I, I, I heard from my mother, who she, she passed away a couple of years ago, but um, um, she would tell stories about her brother and oh, both of her brothers, um, and so it was sort of almost mythology to me. It had been with me since childhood, and it was something I, I tried to understand. I, I mean, I, it was so hard to understand without being so far away from the politics and the history and not knowing that. And you know, so a big part of me with the question was like, what purchase do I have on this story? What 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 right do I have to tell it? But um, as I said in that interview you quoted, for me it was, they, they sacrificed so much for what they believed in and even though I'm growing up in a different world with a different, a different um, I mean English is my first language, I wanted to honor their memory to some degree and I wanted to do it in a way that was as honest as possible. So I had to confront the fact that I, there's this divide that we are in the diaspora. But as we said in the conversation I think we had earlier, the diaspora is there because of what happened. You know, that my, my family was fleeing um, either my uncle's side, they're actual refugees, or from my mother, you know, just like your family being associated with two revolutionaries, known revolutionaries, like her life was really in danger. And um, so just thinking in terms of the fact that we are here, we're here because of, because of that to some degree. Um, for me, the, um, the book tw took 23 years to write, no? I actually started it here in, um, in the U.S. It, as part of my uh, requirements for my degree in journalism in Ohio and then later on here um, at Columbia. And when I started writing it, I said I wanted to write it so that people would understand the era, even if they were not Filipino, but that they could connect as human beings, you know. And so I, w I, I purposely wrote it for um, a non-Filipino audience, at least the parts of, there were nine, there are nine authors, but the parts that um, I wrote, I would show my class, and no one in my class would be Filipino. There would be Latino, there would be African Americans, and um, mostly white people in, in, um, in Colombia and Ohio. And I said, if I get through them, if they understand the story, then Perhaps my nephews and nieces and my own children, I didn't have kids then, but my own children will understand. So I was very conscious of the fact that uh, what I would use would be um, uh, that I would connect to people as human beings. You know, Maybe you don't know the history of the Philippines. Maybe you don't even know where the Philippines is on the map, but we're both human beings. And as such, we can care for the other. You said in the book that 
you went to Nueva Ecija. Nine years later, uh, nine years after June was found dead. So, uh, how was it? Why, why did you do that? Um, when we found uh, the body of June, um, we just knew he was shot seven times, but we did not know the story. And so, for me, I needed closure. No? So, I, um, I still had contacts with uh, people in the underground. No? Even if it was after martial law, there were still people who did not give up the armed struggle. And so I spoke to my contacts and I asked that um, I gave the name of the barrio and uh, my contact went um, asking around. And I actually found the squad, the guerrilla squad that he uh, was part of. I found three members and they told me what happened. Huh? Um, and uh, um, it, it, was, um, it was surreal no? because I, I came in and I was looking at the rice fields where he... Uh, pretty much where he died, uh, and the rice was cut, and there were only stubble. And I was thinking, oh, that is why he wasn't able to hide, because the rice had been cut, and he could easily be seen, and that is why it was so easy to kill him. So um, it was very hard to write about everything. No, I, I, would, uh, I would write two sentences and cry for two weeks. But, <laughs> but I found out that that was the only way I could find closure with the writing. I would love to, you know, you, I think you said one of the, the, the biggest issues with the millennial voters was that they were, in the education system they weren't taught about martial law. So how far back does that history go that, that is not part of the education system? Why isn't it part of it? And what has that struggle been like? Um, I actually went to the extent of going to the Department of Education and to talk to um, people there, people, um, not the Secretary of Education, but uh, uh, the Assistant Secretary of Education. And he said that when, when Marcus was ousted, his generals were still around, no? And the generals would be part of the cabinet, the incumbent cabinets, and they would still be in Senate. And so he said, how do you expect us to write about these torturers, these generals who tortured people, who signed the death penalty for, for thousands of activists and, and students, and when they were still in government to this day, you know? I can mention the names, I guess some of you know them. Honasan, uh, um, Enrile, uh, um, Ramos. Ramos, exactly. But at least he's not in government anymore. But the guy with the... Uh, uh, Balileng? See, yeah, this... Um, Lakson, exactly, yeah. I mean, these guys are still in government. And um, it's been very hard for the Department of Education to really push it. It's in the curriculum, but there's no material, you know. I talked to a lot of um, uh, public school teachers. We had a focus group discussion with public school teachers, and they would only teach the history of the Philippines up until World War II. Okay? And I say, what, why is that? And they would say, martial law is so contentious. You know, we, we look at social media and we're confused. What is propaganda? What does Bong Bong say? Um, how can we trust what's there? Wikipedia changes Marcus's biography weekly. Okay? And so there is a team of oppositionists who weekly also um, change it back. You know, And I know because they've asked me to to be part of the research team of it. So right now, it's really ongoing. We're losing the battle in social media, and we know that the Marcoses are coming back. We fear Duterte because he's killed a lot of people, um, but Duterte will, I think, and this is my personal, Duterte will, will just fall on his own um, weight. No? Um, he'll just topple, but he's, he's too heavy. He's done too many things, but the real, uh, scary part is the Marcoses, and they're coming back. Okay. Um, yeah, definitely the dictatorship is the killings, the disappearances, the torture. That's very scary. But I think the scariest thing about dictatorships is its repeatability. It can come back. It can, it can have a resurgence, like what's happening now in the Philippines, and it's happening here now in the United States. So it's that, that for me that's the scary thing about dictatorships. So now we open the floor to questions from okay. 
Hi, my name is Bianca. What should I say? Um, so I had a question. How has mental health, the perception of mental health changed since, um, since Marcos left? Um, because of like, you mentioned PTSD and all of that. And you said that um, your family didn't have enough money for like therapy and to go to like a psychologist. Do you think that the Philippines has moved forward in their like, in, in the way that they handle mental health? Um, not much because psychologists are, are expensive and, um, and there isn't much state support for, for mental health. No? Um, there's one senator, uh, Lisa Ontiveros, who's been pushing it, and she's done quite a lot of work, but um, other than her, there's really very, very little uh, support from government for that. Interested in, in finding out about um, your own safety uh, and freedom of the press now, and um, how long was your family under surveillance in the 70s and 80s, and is it again under surveillance? I hope not. <laughs> Good God, I hope not. But um, in the 70s, uh, almost immediately, so the entire of martial law, our, our house was, um, our apartment was raided twice. No, uh, A brother of mine also, uh, his house was also raided. And um, I would never trust the, um, the, uh, the telephone no? in, back home because wiretapping is not just solely Obama's fault, but, uh, <laughs> but, but also present in martial law. But um, in fact, when I was here in New York, I, I lived in New York for five years, my, my phone was tapped. Um, and, uh, and it was already after martial law. Um, so now I, uh, I am, I've been getting a lot, my, my friends especially, my Facebook account is very secure. Um, but my other friends, my other colleagues who've been working with me on the campaigns, they receive death threats like daily. Those kids I showed you, the, the kids with the bow tie, um, one of them, Justin, is 23 years old. And the Duterte trolls had put his face, his address, his uh, phone number, and, um, and said, this man hates Duterte, uh, and he gets a thousand um, negative uh, messages on his private cell phone ev every single day, and death threats. And it's scary because they know his address. It, it was posted. So um, I've stopped posting pictures of my family. You look at my Facebook account, it's too grim, and <laughs> it's just all activism. Um, because I'm afraid, you know, that... Uh, that my kids might be targeted, so I don't know. I'm I'm really walking a thin line myself, no. But but we have to because it's it's happening again. Okay. Gina? I was struck by the. Um, I mean, what do you think of the link? I mean, how close is the link of the police procedures with Dokhang and the martial law? Procedures because the description that you had of your brother, someone knocking on the door, that's like, that's basically Tokang. So, um, in your, your relations with the police, you know, your, your understanding of the police, how, how clear is that link of the pr police procedures? Tokang is definitely a police procedure. Yeah. You know, if you go into the, um, the poor areas of Manila now, and you ask them and then you interview them and people will say, oh yes, Tokhang, which is the Operation Tokhang, which is what is happening since Duterte stepped into office, is that at 7 o'clock uh, p.m., um, it's very quiet in poor areas. And you'll say, oh, see, no more criminality. But the thing is, at 9 o'clock, the police cars come in and then they, make, um, then they knock on doors. You know? That is why Tokhang means knock and hang means to plead for your life. So if you hear knocking on your door at, at 9 p.m., then you better start pleading because they don't take prisoners. Unlike during martial law that they would take you to the military camps, here they just kill you. You know, there is no warrant of arrest, nothing. They just outright kill you. And, um, and these are supposedly drug users, you know, or drug dealers, but there is no proof because um, there's no there's no legal procedure to prove that. You're just killed on the spot. So um, is it a police procedure? Everyone knows it is, you know? Um, and then the, uh, the irony of it is, uh, I, I guess you've heard of riding in tandem. Now you would have vigilantes riding on a motorcycle with masks. And then they just 
very um, boldly, you know, um, a friend of mine works for a TV company, and he was crossing the street noontime, and a motorcycle passes by, the guy in front of him gets, gets shot, you know, just like that. And then the guys zoom out, no? zoom, zoom into um, freedom um, on the motorcycle, and, um, and that's it. That's just, just like that, you know. That technique, ironically, was used by the guerrillas to kill the, the police and the military during martial law. Um, and now they're using it against people, but everybody knows it's the police. Yeah, but the DDS were, um, some of them were vigilant, the vigilantes there were the, were, you, um, yeah. the people who surrendered from... Ajina, can you define what DDS mean? Oh, it's not the Davao Death Squad. Yeah, what the, what what what's come out about the devil? But anyway, other questions? Um, yeah, the, the the guy at the back. Yeah, the backmost. Oh, Josh, that's you. Hi, um, I'm Josh. I'm a junior at NYU, and I'm studying like Filipino American literature and and kind of Filipino immigrant stories. And um, my family came over from the Philippines in the early '70s. Um, so they missed a lot of this. Um, and, and I'm interested, um, as somebody who was born in the United States and as somebody who kind of is, is affected by this diaspora of not having that connection to the Philippines, what can, you know, Filipino Americans do to, to learn more about this, especially if, you know, students in the Philippines aren't even learning about um, kind of the Marcos regime and, and this dictatorship? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, I think what Susan's doing, traveling around the U.S. and going to different communities and saying what's going on in the Philippines right now, that's, that's so important to, I don't know if it's inoculating us against it, but Filipinos returning to the, to the Philippines, or Filipinos living in the U.S. returning to the Philippines is a major part of the economy, right? So we, to educate the Filipino-American populace, people who travel and send money back to the Philippines and have families back in the Philippines, that's essential. And... Um, uh, you know, maybe not your family, but but in the communities, you know, uh, talking to people, or taking oral histories, and doing those kinds of projects is essential as well. I think too. I, I I started scratching the surface with my own family, but then there are other people who are related to our family that are living in the U.S. too. That are are just there's just so many stories to be told. Um, I don't know, Susan. Do you have an answer for this? Um, I think uh, he mentioned the. Um Filipinos working abroad and then sending money back. No? That is one very strong um, way to fight this because in the last elections, uh, overseas Filipinos, um, only uh, Amer in America were, um, were the overseas Filipinos supportive of other, um, other presidential candidates other than Duterte. Everywhere else, you know, um, in, in the Middle East, in in Hong Kong, in wherever in Africa, the Filipino overseas um, workers were all pushing for Duterte and some even for Marcos, no? And it's, it's horrible because um, the vote or the say of one OFW or overseas Filipino uh, worker is the vote for 50 others because he sends money or she sends money to the Philippines and that supports at least, you know, uh, 50 other people. So the 50 other people will follow. If she says, vote Duterte, then the 50 people will vote Duterte. Very powerful. And so um, we did not realize that. Only in America did the Filipinos tell their relatives back home. Not, well, some Filipinos here also told them yeah. <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> um, uh, but, but that is um, your opinion matters. Um, I think uh, what is happening in this country with Trump it's just a mirror of what is happening elsewhere. And together, we have to be um, very vigilant, you know. Our never again is also your never again, because what affects you affects us, and France, and the Netherlands, and anywhere where there is a swing against, um, uh, against uh, democracy, you know. So um, in, in answer to your question, what can Filipino Americans do? We can, and I've told this at several um, fora with uh, Filipino Americans in universities. We cannot answer trolls, no, because we were we will get uh, threatened. Um, Lenny Robredo, who is the incumbent vice president of the Philippines and possibly the only one who can stand up to Duterte, 
um, a very sweet woman. She has three daughters. She's a widow. She has three daughters ages 12 to, I think, uh, 21 or 23. Um, Duterte trolls have posted pictures of the three girls and say, what a pleasure it would be to rape these girls, you know? I mean, really horrible things like that. Um, when we were at the um, Supreme Court, the petitioners, all these old women who were petitioning the Supreme Court not to let Marcos be buried, when we left uh, the Supreme Court, we passed by a thousand Marcos loyalists who yelled to the women, the women you saw on the video, they said, is that the woman who was raped? Why is she so ugly? Why would anyone want to rape her? You know, things like that in public. So we get harassed, but you don't, you know, because you're in America. So what can you do? Don't answer the trolls, never reply, because that they get paid for every reply that you do. But go in, <laughs> I'm teaching Facebook. <laughs> I don't believe this, my daughter will crack up. Um, but go to comments and put your comment there, name the person before, and then put the comment there. But don't answer, let's say, Susan Kimpo and then your reply, because for every reply that you give, they get, um, they get paid. You know? so, so things, or the other thing is to, um, there, uh, there are fake news uh, sites, no? When we report them to Facebook in the Philippines, Facebook Philippines doesn't even, they don't give a damn. They don't listen to us. But they keep putting down the opposition um, uh, websites and the, the blogs, no? So if you complain to Facebook America saying that Facebook Philippines is, you know, um, is, is keeping up the, uh, the Marcos trolls and Duterte trolls and shutting down their opposition, then maybe that could help. Okay, another question? Uh, yes. Uh, I've had the thought that um, in the United States, one thing that we can do um, to uh, support human rights activists in the Philippines is to send money. And um, I'm wondering if there's something else that you think we should be doing, and also um, uh, where, what groups we should be sending our money to. Um, actually, I'm uh, I'm part of a an, um, a project right now. What we're doing, and we're starting this summer, is that we're going to different public schools, you no, know? and we're going to as many schools as we can. We're in in touch with two universities. We'll go into the provinces and then teach uh, public school teachers how to teach martial law. Because if they say there is no material there, um, then we come and we give workshops and, um, and provide them with the materials um, and a traveling exhibit. No? Um, and so we're going to do this until 2022. Hoping, because the grade 6 people, the grade 6 kids are the next millennials. They're the biggest batch of voters. So before Marcos um, uh, gets to them, we hopefully will get to them. And uh, there are people in academe doing this. They're historians. We have a lot of volunteers um, to train. We're using a lot of theater tactics no, from, uh, from PETA. Um, we're using a lot of creative pedagogy. Um, and a, a group of filmmakers have volunteered to create videos. So if you're willing to to um, sponsor that as a project, then then yes, I can give you the uh, the name of a 501c3 um, organization here in Seattle that's uh, working on it with us. Um, but in terms of human rights, um, the um, well, that too, no, I can I can find out for you if you want. Uh, but human rights workers are being threatened already. Um, the commissioner of, of human rights, the head himself, the chair, is a uh, constantly being um, lambasted by Duterte. His budget, uh, he's, he's government, right? He's part of the government. The budget is held, so they can't do any human rights work, and they have to solicit uh, from outside sources. So. Okay, I just have a belated response to Josh as to what Filipino-American youth can, can do to help. Um, first, I guess, is to join Filipino-American student organizations in your schools and then collectively lobby the administration to have Philippine history, Philippine studies courses 
That's one. Or secondly, you could, on your own, hold forum discussions on uh, what's happening in the Philippines and the mar history of martial law. And thirdly, you could form um, Philippine human rights committees, support for human rights in the Philippines. So there are a lot of things that Filipino-American students can do here in the United States. Um, just one more question. Is there somebody working on the internet from here? Is there, are there people in the United States working against the internet trolls? Like this social media battle? Not yet, not yet. Not that I know of. You can start it. <laughs> I wonder, Susan Dahl, I was thinking, you were talking about sixth graders being the next batch. Of, I wonder if that, you know, just from the, the standpoint of people who write fiction, nonfiction, poetry, if, if um, like young adult fiction, children's literature that, that addresses the, the issues in history of martial law, there's a need for that. So that way those books can be taught in the classroom. Um, what is what we found out to be effective for that um, for the YA audience um, is the graphic novel or comics. You know? So stories about martial law done in comic book style is very effective. You know? And um, also the the teachers are very uh, the teachers of history are very young. They're in their twenties. So they say we don't have the material. But if you give them the material, and that's part of our project. Um, and to make it palatable, like, like the comic book, then yeah, hopefully that would work. Other questions? <laughs> yes. Hi, thank you so much for, for sharing all of these stories. My family also came from the Philippines around in the 80s. Um, yeah, very, a lot of stories there. Um, hearing all of this, it's, it's very emotional. It's very, of course, terrifying and, and and angry, of course. I'm, I'm wondering also kind of what is driving you guys, what's, for both of you, like what is one thing that you find hopeful? I live in uh, the Twin Cities and uh, the day of the Women's March, there were 200,000 protesters at the Capitol. The largest protest before that was 70,000. So the, it just blew that mark. Um, I think everyone was elated that day. Um, and then that feeling fades when the next r batch of bad news rolls in. But, so we just have to remember that we're not alone and that we actually outnumber um, those that, who are, are trying to silence us and make us feel isolated. Um, this is one community. There are many other communities out there and we speak to each other, we work together. Um, and, and to continue to do that and, and to, if we, could, if we can have somehow within this to continue to make art and be creative and, and tell stories and tell histories with each other, um, we're stronger than them that way. And, and I think that it, it is terrifying what you're saying. I'm terrified. I was just talking to a very good friend of mine about, like, you know, I think I've stopped waking up at four or five in the morning and worrying about, <laughs> worrying about Trump. You know, I, I still am worried about it, but I don't like wake up and I'm arrested by it. Um, we have work to do, you know, and, and that can keep us going too. And also just the courage of people that I, seeing Susan talk about this and the courage of the work that she's doing and all of those young people that were in that video, that gives me hope because um, I mean, we're all terrified inside, but just to see the kind of courage that they have and the kind of brilliance and, and intelligence um, people like Susan have is, is inspiring for me. Um, it's very hard to find hope in the Philippines now, no? Um, but I've been going around schools um, ever since the book came out. It first came out in the Philippines in 2012. Ever since it came out, I've been receiving invitations to speak at schools. And I, I try to go to all of them, no? as far as Mindanao and as far as up north. Um, and, uh, and what gives me hope are the kids. Because when you talk to the kids, it's, they just really don't know the history. And I think that's very significant that um, we have to know our histories. You know? um, uh, it's a good thing that you showed slides of, of Samar and, and the howling wilderness because a lot of Filipinos do not know that even in the Philippines. But the key really is to know your history. And so if I go back into the classrooms and I say, um, uh, this really happened and I am living proof of it, um, then then the kids really take on. and. Uh, and I see it, like if I speak to a, a group of 300 um, grade 10 students, you know, and I step out of the classroom and I feel, well, at least of the 300, I know 50 will not vote for Marcos in 2022, then that gives me hope, you know. So 
but there's also a lot of attacks. No? Um, even here, while I'm doing these tours, I've been getting attacks. So um, pray for me, really. I mean, seriously. Other questions? Uh, yes, at the back, please. Hi, I just have like a very technical question. Have you been seeing currently more f Filipinos applying for asylum in the United States, France, Canada, any other countries? Like, has there been, has there been an uptick in applications or are many Filipinos just sort of like, this will pass, you know, we shouldn't be uprooting our lives? Um, there are people who already need um, political asylum, especially the whistleblowers against Duterte and his death squads. Um, and I think at least matubato, as I, I think of um, trying to apply for, uh, um, for Europe. No? But uh, if they are um, seeking refugee um, status or asylum, I don't think they'll be telling the world. No? Um, my own brothers, two of my brothers went for political asylum and they kept very, very quiet no? um, until they got it. So. Yes. Um, hi, uh, my parents were also from the Philippines. They were younger around that, um, the martial law. Um, but I wanted to ask about like the relationship to language. I know, I actually talked to my parents the other day and they said they were taught exclusively in English. Like in school they were only taught in English and I thought that was representative with all the students chanting a lot in English and the signs were a lot in English. But at the same time they were saying that you know, Duterte is America's puppet. Like, what is really the relationship, this really complicated relationship between the U.S. and the Philippines? Actually, it was uh, Marcos, who was the, uh, who, yeah. Marcos, who's the lapdog of the Americans. Because, like I said earlier, it was the, um, during the Vietnam War, for example, that he was pandering to, uh, to America and, um, because America supported the dictatorship all throughout, no? Um, and the, um, uh, the other question, the, that's interesting that you found the signs in English. Um, actually, the millennials who came out, of the out on the streets were coming from the elite schools, um, which were uh, Ateneo um, uh, private schools. No? Um, even UP, the University of the Philippines, was a late bloomer when it came to the protest against the burial. Um, I would credit it because the, uh, the faculty and administration of this three schools, St. Scholasticus, um, well, for Miriam, uh, La Salle, and Ateneo, the faculty themselves were really holding fora every week. Um, they would call us and ask us to give, to talk to students, to go into classrooms, to show videos. So um, it wasn't, that's why it was, uh, uh, tell me what democracy looks like, you know? <laughs> I mean, when I heard that, I was, I was saying, gee, so the, even the slogans are in English now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, because these were the, the elite schools. And you know, that's a nice thing too, that they cared to come out. Thank you, Susan and Chris, for sharing. It's very emotional. And my question is, how do you articulate and make it effective the the line right now that if you are pro Duterte or you are anti Duterte, you are pro yellow tard. That's a very bad word. Like you are for the Aquino oligarchs. So how do you um, master uh, support for, and uh, you know how to rationalize all this that it, it, it is beyond the oligarchic politics? Thank it's you. very hard no, because um, uh, I was never um, I was never yellow. <laughs> I was more red than yellow. Um, now I'm just pink. <laughs> but um, but the, the, the thing was, anyone who goes against um, Duterte is immediately labeled yellow. But I think the trick is, is instead of going defensive and saying, no, 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 I'm not yellow, is to embrace yellow. Embrace the fact that, um, seriously, it was, it was the yellows that started the People Power Revolution and actually was the last straw in getting Marcos out, you know? So for me, and I'm not yellow, but I give credit to the yellows for that, that yes, it was a yellow revolution that got Marcos out eventually, you know? And um, so I think is instead of just being on the defensive, claim what history is and stand from a point of view 
or from the strength of history and say, yes, we're yellow and we're proud of it. You know, we have good leaders and uh, there are yellow leaders in, um, in Senate now, the most outspoken ones are yellows, but they're doing very good work, you know. So instead of being defensive, um, is to take history and, and use it. Hi, my name is Karen. Thank you both so much. Um, Susan, I, I'm really interested in this question of healing. And you've talked a little bit about um, counseling and writing, um, as well as visiting Nueva Ecija. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you and your family have found healing um, in response to what happened. We have not. <laughs> um, I think I have, but for some members of my family, they cannot talk about it. No? And I, I was shocked because when we were, when I started writing the book, in fact, um, one sister uh, very angrily emailed me and said, why do you want to wash dirty laundry in public? You know? And I said, it's not dirty laundry, it's history. And she didn't talk to me for two years. No? Um, and uh, um, I'm the only one in my family who, who does this, who can come out and talk on TV and talk to groups. My, my other siblings, one even said, why do you even bother? You know, Why do you bother at this point? And, um, and I just told her, because martial law, even if I personally was not arrested, martial law really left deep scars. And I, I feel I have to speak for the people who died. You know? and, so, um, and so I do this. And, but for different members of the family, um, they don't really talk about it. Uh, even during at the dinner table, uh, very few of us would, um, would e even attempt to recall the past. So writing the book, it was difficult for us. There, there, were a lot, uh, there was a lot of battles within the family itself, just writing the book and, and how people saw it as individuals. Um, but, uh, but I'm glad it's out because then it shows one family with v looking at the past with uh, different lenses now. You know? And I think that's the value of the honesty of the book. So, so healing, not for all. Okay. Question. Hi, Susan. Um, this is more of sharing. I and maybe I'll ha I'll ask the question later. I'm getting emotional now. I'm also my family is also a victim of martial law. My name, by the way, my name is Maria Carpio. My maiden name was Maria Luisa Ariado. We have my brother Antonio Ariado was also killed and was an activist during um, the Marcos's time. And that's the reason why my daughter and I are here uh, today. And this morning, I, I remember we have, my brother is also in the Bantayog. His name is in the Bantayog. And um, this morning, as I remember, there was a newsletter featuring all the heroes and the martyrs that are featured. There, and your brother was in that magazine, and I have it with me. And when I opened it, I opened it to the page where your brother was featured. And I said I was reading it. And it says your, your brother is 7 of 12, 7 in, of 12, right? Well, 10 uh, children, uh, so 12 with my parents, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. But uh, it's 7th of uh, family, 7th in, in the family. And my brother was also 7th in the family, but we are 14 siblings. We're bigger than your family. So anyway, my family now is like, like yours. We, don't, we do talk about what happened to our brother, Tony. I was only in sixth grade when Tony was killed. And I, very, I have a vague, um, I have a vague uh, memory of exactly what happened. But whatever I remembered, I remembered like long marches, like from from, we are from Bicol, and we are in, from Sorsogon. And during that time, there was long marches. And I remember that my parents would prepare something, food, drinks, for, pe uh, for the activists who, ha who march from Sorsogon to our town and going back to Sorsogon again, because we live in, a, in a, the farthest part of Sorsogon. So I remember that, but I didn't re really understand like, what's going on 
um, I, was, I was, I think, 13 years old at that time. But my family now is also like divided like yours. Like some will not talk about it, I guess, anymore. But when I, when I saw the, um, the news regarding the, the Marcos burial, I started, um, I went on my Facebook and started saying stuff about the Marcoses. And one reply was, I got this one reply maybe from one of the trolls that said, why, what did Marcos uh, do to, your, to you? And I said, this is my personal battle. This is my personal opinion. And I have a right to say this. But um, I guess my, my question too would be, I be I, I'm glad that you shared about, about this and that um, the, the, what's really going on. I think I, I have a clearer picture now of what's going on in the Philippines. I haven't been there in a long time. I haven't visited. But I'm worried about the, f the rest of my family that's in the Philippines. And I think I'm, I, I would be interested to find out where and how I can help. And if there's a group, of, um, a group that you have um, that's here in, in, in New York that I could be, I could help in my own way. So I would be interested in that. And thank you for coming and sharing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing too. It's, it's it's really something to find closure for this. Um, I found it through writing the book. And I can only tell you that you have to find your own way of how to find closure. But um, and yes, I'll, I'll give you a, a, the name of an organization. Um, uh, uh, they're in Seattle, but I, I know they have friends all around. Um, but, but I think my advice for you is w the next generation has to know about this. So. Even if you're not a writer or, or whatever, just write it out you know, and, and pass it on to your nie nieces and nephews and your own children um, because they will ask later on and at least there's something there. Any, any more questions? Yes. Um, <coughs> Sorry. Uh, I want to thank you both for being here because uh, as a Filipino-American, nice to have access to Filipino writers because I just haven't really met that many. Um, and this is a question for Susan. Um, I was in the Philippines last year for four months and I left the day after the election. And um, then I spent the summer after the results sort of like calling my relatives and friends and then also calling like people that work for my relatives and friends. And I realized that there was like this huge divide between them. You know, like everybody who worked for someone that I knew was for Duterte and most of my family and my friends were Mar Rojas supporters. And I, and I read a lot on blogs and stuff and I just wondered how the resistance is and who are the people in the resistance and what are the numbers like? Because in the summer, it was still sort of like a 92% like a approval rating or something. You know, like it was kind of crazy and I didn't understand. I mean, being coming from America, I mean, we have limited sort of knowledge of what it is to live in certain places in the Philippines and I, I recognize that fact but you know I still judge the extrajudicial killings and everything that's happening and I and I just realize and you know the divide is sort of like narrowing a little bit and some of the people who are for Duterte even you know working for my family and, and stuff like that are starting to waver but they also understand that there are killings happening and that doesn't sometimes seem to bother some of them you know, and uh, I just wonder what your sort of uh, thoughts are about what the numbers are like and what the people are like and what that sort of sentiment is like in the Philippines. Like, I, I just, to give to us as being in America so, to sort of like understand what, what the fight is really like there. Yeah. Um, I think the um, SWS survey, uh, which is the Social Weather Station survey, I think in December or January, pegged um, the popularity rate or the uh, approval rate of Duterte at 84. No? But the same people were asked, um, uh, what was the approve, did they approve of the death penalty? And did they approve of the extrajudicial killings? And their answer was also no, 84%. You know, 83 pala, 83 yung approval rating for Duterte, and then 84, no, we are not uh, approving of the death penalty or the, um, or the drug war. And um, uh, I would say it's, it's, it's the same here. You know, we wonder why Trump got elected. 
um, and I, I would see also the same. Uh, I've been going around for the last month, um, six cities in 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 one month, and um, with the and and I would ask people, you know, what what happened, and they would say the same thing, and it really is a mirror. Um, uh, we say in the Philippines that people are sick and tired of elite politics, you know, of the oligarchs still holding on to power. The oligarchs meaning the Aquinos again, the same Mar Rojas again, and people like that. And, and ironically, Duterte has used the term um, anything elite is bad. Okay? Anything that's yellow is bad. Um, and so populist leaders would take uh, um, a multifaceted group of people and just create one general uh, judgment on them. And so anyone who's elite is now bad. It doesn't matter if that person is, uh, has done so much good or that Mar Rojas's father suffered also um, under Marcos. Um, there's just all these judgments. And why am I saying this? I think what we are missing is that we have failed to listen to regular people, um, to common folk. Um, I've been here a few weeks, and when the the uh, when the wiretapping thing happened with um, the tweet, um, I was watching TV with my host, and um, in the morning the the story about the the um, the tweet on wiretapping came out, and for the full day on on TV, everybody was making comments about it, and I was listening, and I couldn't understand the comments, and. And you know, I consider myself educated, um, and I understand English, but I couldn't understand it. There was too much analysis. No, in the Philippines, people were saying um, people like Mar Rojas or the elite or the other politicians who were good, you know, including Lenny Robredo, were too intelligent. No, did not understand the normal uh, guy on the street, uh, the fisherman, the the farmer, you know, the guy who pushes the cart with um, uh, paper refuse and all that stuff. Um, they would, the trolls would say, ang tatalino nyo kasi, you are too intellectual. And then it hits me, that's right, you know? We are talking a, a language that only we in our own bubble understand. We have forgotten to really listen to the poor, no? Um, and that's why Trump wins, and that's why Duterte wins, because they just use the sound bites that I am for change, you know, like what change? But it sounds good, so yeah. Um, so so it's a wake up call to again listen to what people really um, what people really need. I don't know. I'm not a an analyst, but um, just listening to your TV stations and I'm listening to over analysis. I don't get it. So how would the common man understand as well? So, sorry, I just have a follow-up. Can I just have a follow-up question? Is, um, it's me again. <laughs> yeah, okay. So is there, because I, I was actually, I listened to a lot of the debates like last a April and May, and I, I can understand a, a lot of Tagalog, but not everything. But you're right. I mean, they, I, I remember when Duterte was debating, he said things like, oh, your, your you know, uh, Wharton business degree didn't teach you how the, the people, you know, and it was a, a very big talking point for him, like all the Ivy League schools in Oxford and that everybody else went to. But so, what is the, what is the middle look? Is there like someone in the middle that is, not Duterte and not Roja, but maybe like more for the people and still, you know, I mean, I don't really know what I know. There's five different political groups, right? If you look at Lenny Robredo, and I'm sorry for the people in the audience who do not know this politicians, but our incumbent vice president, Lenny Rubredo, started with zero points. She, nobody knew her, no? but, now, but now she won. No? And her, her um, uh, people were saying, I've never heard her speak, but when she speaks to an audience, there is 100% conversion because she's just saying it as it is in very simple language in Tagalog or in whatever language, if Cebuano, I think she also speaks Cebuano, and she just, like I said to you earlier, talk to people as human beings, connect as human beings, and then you get through. You know, the Wharton degree doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean anything. But Lenny did that, and her conversion rate was so fast that it really shocked the Marcoses. 
Um, so if we're just looking for personalities and just looking for a middle ground, I think it would be her. Okay. We still have time for one more question. One last question. Okay. I have another question. Uh -huh. um, what are uh, gender? What do gender politics look like in the Philippines? Because I recently, I knew that there was a trans woman who was recently in Congress, and I was wondering how gender is being affected um, under Duterte. Oh, horribly, <laughs> he's um, he's very um, he's s s super macho. No, um, he would talk about. Uh, there was one, there was a woman, a maid who was, um, I think was killed and she, and Duterte said, oh, she's only a maid. So I peeked at her corpse a little longer. I lifted her dress a little longer. Or he would say things about the vice president and saying, um, it's so difficult um, to uh, speak to an audience when all I see is your legs, you know. Um, really uh, uncouth, no? Um, so, and, and now, because he's the, um, he basically has given every man the permission to do the same thing to other women, no? and we're feeling it. Um, and so it's, it's very hard. Uh, you are right about this, woman, this uh, transgender uh, representative in Congress, but um, she's just one person, you know. It's, it's very hard for her, and she gets a lot of flack as well. Okay, so with that, I think one last question that we need to, we don't, we don't have to answer it today, although we started discussing it earlier today, but let's keep it in our minds. I think the last question that should, we should take home with us is, what should we do and what can we do while here in the United States? So with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming here on a very nice Sunday afternoon. People have asked about Filipino-American and Filipino literature, but um, Nick Joaquin is going to be published. He's the third <coughs> Filipino who will be published by Penguin Classics. Um, the launch of it will be at the embassy on April 18th. So I just wanted to, um, to send that out, and then I hope that you guys can be there as well. It's the Philippine Embassy on April 18th. Embassy Nick Joaquin. In, in this Do you know who Nick Joaquin is? Sorry. <laughs> or in, uh, yeah. or consulate? The consulate. Oh, yeah. The consulate. The consulate. Yeah, Nick Joaquin is, uh, is the great Filipino writer National English, artist, who yeah. lived in Manila forever. He's a Manilenio. Um, and he stayed there. He's, he, actually, he stopped. He refused to publish during the Marcos years. Um, and that was a big deal for the Marcoses because, because he was such a great personality. And um, he is after Rizal. And after Jose Garcia Villa, he's the third Filipino that Penguin, Penguin Classics will publish. So I'm hoping that you can be there. Okay, good. And also, thank you to our resource person speakers for the day, Chris Santiago and Susan Kimpo. It's a very, very powerful presentation. And even though we're done with speaking here, the event is not yet done. We have wine and water at the back, so feel free to hang around and make friends and network. We need the network. You heard? Oh, by the way, there are books for sale at the back if you want to buy uh, Tula and Subversive Lives.